It's Friday. It's Brunch with Bernie. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. Sanders.senate.gov, of course, is website. Bernie, welcome to the program. Good to be with you, Tom. Glad to have you. Um, what's it, what's on your list? Well, obviously, I think uh, no one can ignore or should ignore what's going on in, in Boston, the tragedy that took place at the Boston Marathon, one of the just great events uh, in our country. And and now this business with these uh, two brothers, so I think I, I speak for everybody that we hope that the perpetrators are apprehended as quickly as possible and that there is no loss of life. We've seen enough. and um, So we hope that uh, comes to an end as, as soon as possible. Uh, obviously also, as uh, everybody knows, uh, the Congress dealt with guns uh, this week. And on uh, some of the important provisions, including background checks, there was a significant majority but in the United States Senate, majority does not rule. You need 60 votes. Uh, we did not gain 60 votes. I think we had 56 on uh, the issue of background checks, which seems to me just to be a, a fairly common sense approach to trying to make sure that uh, while you're not going to solve, you know, mass killings overnight, at least uh, you, we can make and should make every effort to keep guns out of the hands of people. Uh, who should, should not have them. So, you know, that was uh, a loss and a disappointing loss, but it also speaks to another issue that we've talked a whole lot about, and that is the need for filibuster reform and, and not require 60 votes for every important piece of legislation that Congress uh, has to deal with. Uh, I suspect that perhaps as soon as next week the issue of immigration will come to the Senate floor. Uh, we will see what happens there. A number of it's a complicated piece of legislation dealing with a number of, of issues. Um, one of them is what do we do with 11 million people who are in this country, have worked in this country, uh, but are here without documentation. Uh, and I think there is a growing sentiment among the American people uh, that there should be a, a, a path towards citizenship uh, for these folks. Many of them are working, many of them are law-abiding. Uh, but that they should not be granted amnesty, and they should get to the end of the line in terms of citizenship. But uh, it is important, I think, for the country that we take uh, these people out of the shadows, where in many cases they're living in fear and they're, they're being exploited uh, economically. The other part of the issue, which doesn't get quite the attention that I think deserves, has to do with guest worker programs, which is also under the rubric of the immigration bill. And what that's about is that in this country, uh, legally, there are large numbers of folks who come to do uh, work that ostensibly uh, American employers cannot find Americans to do. I think in some cases that's true, in some cases that's not true. So it's a, it's a, it's a very important issue. And, and I think what you want out of that, and what I'm working on, uh, is to enable employers to be able to find those categories of workers where, in fact, you can't find American workers. Uh, and I think in agriculture, I was um, uh, some years ago involved uh, with uh, tomato workers in Immokalee, Florida. Uh, and all of that work is done by foreign labor, uh, virtually all of it. And it is hard work. It is work where wages are not particularly good. Uh, and a lot of workers there are being exploited, in some cases exploited ruthlessly. So how you create a mechanism for those folks to be living and working in this country legally is what we're working on, and not be exploited and have legal rights uh, is, is a very important issue. Now, the negative of all of this is that it is clear to me that there are some employers who really are not reaching out to immigrants because they can't find American labor, but simply to bring in workers who will work for lower wages and push down the wage scale, and that's going on as well. So we want to be careful that that does not happen. We want to be careful that when there are jobs that Americans can do, and most of these jobs Americans can do. I remember some years ago, I think it was ExxonMobil, using uh, welders, as, as I recall, from, uh, uh, from India, I believe, uh, because they quote-unquote, couldn't find American welders. Well, I don't believe that for a second. Uh, so how you draw that balance where you do not bring in people to be exploited to drive down wages and take jobs away from Americans 
is important. On the other hand, where there are gaps, uh, where employers legitimately cannot find American workers, how we address that. So that's an important part of the uh, immigration uh, situation. Uh, the ongoing debate over the budget deficit reduction, uh, you and I have talked about that on many occasions. Uh, in my view, the deficit clearly was caused by uh, two wars that were unpaid for, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan that Bush got us into, uh, huge tax breaks for the wealthy, uh, other programs unpaid for, and also the Wall Street caused recession, which has resulted in a significant decline in revenue coming in to our uh, to, the, to the coffers uh, Treasury Department uh, as a percentage of GDP. We're now at about the lowest point that we've been in in some 60 years. Uh, our Republican friends think that the only solution to this problem, which is what the Ryan budget in the House is all about, is to cut everything, to cut to end Medicare as we know it, massive cuts in Medicaid, in education, in nutrition programs, heating programs. Uh, I think that that's totally absurd at a time when we have so much income and wealth inequality in this country where the wealthy are doing phenomenally well. Corporations are enjoying record-breaking profits. CEOs are now making something like 350 times what their workers are making. I do not believe that you balance the budget on the backs of the elderly, the children, the sick, or the lowest-income people in this country. Uh, unfortunately, in some of these areas, President uh, Obama has uh, really done pretty much what the Republicans have wanted, and that is especially in this business of cuts in Social Security and benefits for disabled vets through a so-called chain CPI. Uh, I think that that is morally unacceptable, and I think it's just very bad economics. Uh, but the president has brought that forward and offered that as a compromise that the Republicans are prepared to uh, raise uh, some revenue. I think it's a bad idea, and I won't support it under any circumstance, but certainly as a bargaining position uh, to uh, for a Democratic president who is supposed to be representing the middle class to bring forth voluntarily and offer to cut uh, Social Security and, and, and veterans programs and raise premiums on Medicare does does not make any sense to me at all. So we're working hard against that proposal. And, you know, I just actually am in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, uh, speaking to you. Know, we just did a town meeting with seniors, and we had just a wonderful turnout. And I think what I saw here is, is true all over the country. When you talk to seniors, so many of them are hurting. They're living on twelve, thirteen, fifteen thousand dollars a year. Social Security is just either all or almost all of their income, and it's just very, very unfair when when these folks are faced with high prescription drug costs, high health care costs, high heating costs. Uh, you shouldn't be balancing the budget on their backs. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour. We'll keep you up to date on what's going on in Boston throughout the program. So far, no changes in the situation. Police are still looking for the second, the younger suspect, um, uh, Zokar Tsarnev. Uh, but we'll be back with more with Senator Sanders. Your calls for Bernie right after this. Stick around. This is the Tom Hartman Program. And be sure to check out Bernie's website, sanders.senate.gov. You can sign up for the Bernie Buzz, and it's always a great news source. And welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you. Senator Sanders still with us? I'm right here. Okay, great. Uh, Anthony in Bakersfield, California, watching us on Free Speech TV on the DISH Satellite Network. You are on the air, Senator Sanders. Yes, yes that is correct, Tom. It's a pleasure to speak with you, Your Honor. I admire your work, and, and I'm a huge fan of, of yours, uh, Senator. Thanks very thank much. Thank you for all the work that you've done. And I, I've got a question about the bombing in, in Boston. Uh, I have relatives there, and I believe uh, um, Crystal, if it's my cousin Crystal that was killed, then it's my third cousin that was killed in the bombing. Okay. What I want to know, uh, Your Honor, is how do we stop police from destroying evidence and murdering suspects, and I mean murdering unarmed people as well? How do we stop them so we can get to the bottom of, of this bombing, this act, and, and find the evidence and the facts and the truth and get to the bottom of it and find the actual truth so that we can understand why these things are happening. And I've got a good idea, and I don't want to go into that right now, but that's the question I'd like to uh, well, you know, hear okay. from Thank you. you. Uh, in, in, 
you know, I, I think it's important for us to put uh, ourselves into the minds of the police officers of that. What they are worried about uh, is IEDs being placed around Boston. Is it true? I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But clearly you're dealing with some people who have no respect for human life who are prepared to kill uh, wantonly. Uh, clearly the goal, and I'm sure the, the FBI and the police and everybody else involved there, wants it. you want to capture these people. You gotta learn their stories. Why are they doing this? Who are they connected to? And a dead body is not gonna give you all that evidence. So I would, you know, I, I think, but the police now are, are, are very worried about, are, are, are more bombs going off, uh, more death, deaths occurring. Uh, but I would hope, and I think we all hope, that the uh, suspects are captured and can be in, in, interrogated. Paul in South Lyon, Michigan, watching Free Speech TV on Dish Network. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yeah, uh, first I wanna, thank Tom for uh, using the public airwaves to promote the public good and also want to thank uh, Bernie for doing all that he could to, to uh, stop the, the murder of 11,000 Americans every year with guns uh, yeah I was watching uh, ABC News on Wednesday ABC so-called news and their whole report about the, the you know the, the, the filibuster thing, they never said the word Republican, and they never said the word filibuster. I mean, the, uh, the, the media is spinning it as... Paul, we just Obama have 40 Hale seconds. Can I, can I get Bernie's response to you right well, away? I, I think Paul raises a good question. Here's where the media is at. I mean, and on a very important point, I think the first caller complimented Tom for using the public airways for the public good, and, and Tom does a great job, and we have some other great uh, radio people out there who really do try to educate and hear from people and have serious discussions about serious issues, but they're a, a very small uh, minority. Uh, so I think when you talk about media in general, what we have to understand is like every other aspect of American society, uh, you have a, a small number of huge media conglomerates uh, who own and control of what we see, hear, and read. I, I think many of the media people themselves try to show how non-biased they are, right-wing extremist Republican Party, uh, you are being dishonest, I, I think, by somehow trying to forge a middle ground and not calling uh, a state a state. Twenty minutes past the hour. Welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you. Um, no change. Tom, can I continue that thought? Certainly, Senator okay. Sanders. And so I think what Paul was asking about how come you know the media wasn't talking about filibuster. Well, let's, let, if you could it. reset the question, Bernie, because some people didn't hear the question. Yeah, we had, we had a call from Michigan, I think, who, who asked about you know, media coverage of the gun debate, uh, and there was not a lot of reference to a Republican filibuster, uh, which is what it was. Uh, if my memory is correct, I think we ended up with fifty-six votes, and maybe read. Uh, changed his vote so he could bring it up again later. But uh, that's a pretty good majority who wanted stronger background checks. Uh, we lost. We lost with 56 votes. And most people say that's pretty strange. You know, usually majority wins, but not in the Senate. Uh, this was a Republican filibuster. There were some Democrats uh, who did not vote for uh, stronger background checks. I think that there were four or five. Uh, but virtually all Republicans did not vote for it. So this was very clearly a Republican filibuster, an overwhelming Republican uh, opposition to strong background checks, period. That's what it is. And what uh, Paul was saying is the media did not report it that way, and I think he's, he's uh, pretty much right. Yeah, I, I found myself yelling at the TV, uh, why, why don't you use the word filibuster? Why don't you point out? Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Denise in Claremont, California, listening on Sirius Satellite Radio. You're on the air Senator Sanders. Hi, Senator Sanders. Um, we all know that, that the budget the president um, put forth is a bad budget because of cuts to Social Security. Can't you as a senator stop that, veto it? Well, Isn't there something you can do well, as a we senator are, yeah. without uh, having to vote on it? To answer your question, we are working very, very hard on it. And one way I worked on it as a member of the Budget Committee, the way it works uh, is, as you know, the House presents a budget. The House budget 
uh, was written by uh, Congressman Paul Ryan of Wisconsin, who's chairman of the Budget Committee. That was a disastrous budget. Uh, he moved to make savage cuts uh, in Medicare, Medicaid, education, nutrition programs, every program of relevance to ordinary Americans. Uh, that's the House budget, and, and without asking for a nickel of new revenue uh, from the wealthiest people of the largest corporations. Uh, I'm on the Senate Budget Committee, and we presented a budget. didn't go as far as I wanted to go, but was an infinitely better budget than the Ryan budget and a lot better budget than the President's budget. And it did require uh, a substantial amount, almost a trillion dollars worth of new revenue uh, coming from the closing of uh, corporate loopholes. One out of four corporations pays nothing in taxes. We're losing uh, just about $100 billion every year by corporations taking advantage of tax havens in the Cayman Islands or Bermuda, et cetera. So we addressed that issue, and we did not touch uh, Social Security at all. No cuts in Social Security or benefits for disabled vets. So we are working hard now. The president's budget, Denise, is just a proposal. That's all it is. It's not law. Uh, and the debate goes on. And uh, obviously I'm going to work as hard as I can for a budget that asks uh, those people who are earning huge amounts of money to start paying their fair share, those corporations who are paying nothing to start paying their fair share of taxes, and at the same time we're going to protect uh, working families, the elderly and, and, and the disabled and those people who are hurting. Pete in Georgetown, Texas, watching on Free Speech TV on Dish Network. You are on the air, Pete, with Senator Bernie Sanders. Hi, Senator Sanders. You're very much my hero, and I'm wondering, can criminal charges be filed against the owners of the West Texas fertilizer plant? The place was just about blown off the map, and the casualties keep rising. Terrible, terrible. I mean, you know, what a week it's been. We've had Boston, and we've had West Texas. Um, The answer is, Pete, I think you're just going to have to, we're going to have to wait and see what the cause of that ex- that terrible explosion was. So I think we can't talk about um, uh, bringing charges un- until we know what caused it. But certainly if there was a, a dereliction in responsibility and safety standards, uh, that is something absolutely that should be and must be looked at. Okay. Lee in Las Vegas, Nevada, you are on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi, Mr. Sanders. I'm a very big fan of yours. And I I need to ask you a question that really no one has really brought up. And this really irks me. It's it's about, you know, the tragedy that happened in Texas. Okay? All of a sudden, Mr. Perry, the hypocrite, right? Here he is when we had that disaster, Sandy. He's up rousing. I don't know how we're going to pay for it, this and that. He votes no. Right? What does he do? A day after the disaster, we need money, he says. Is that not a hypocrite or what, Mr. Sanders? All of a sudden, he needs money and he wants it right away, Mr. Sanders. But meanwhile, the people, those people, those poor people of um, of Hurricane Sandy had to do all that waiting and they had to be embarrassed into getting the money. What do you think about that, Mr. Well, Sanders? what I think is, uh, I have to tell you, Lee, I... I been preoccupied with some other issues, and I have had not followed Governor Perry on this issue. I can I can just fill you in, Bernie, yeah. real quickly. Yeah. He uh, came out today and asked, or maybe late yesterday afternoon, and specifically asked the president to expedite emergency aid to Texas well, for okay. this bond. Well, that's what Lee is talking about. And he had, and when Sandy was being de- debated, he uh, in a press conference referred to it as pork. <laughs> yep, I guess hypocrisy is the right word, Lee. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> So. You know, look, here's what the issue is. Uh, we are a nation, and we're a nation in which Vermont is one of the states, and Texas is one of the states, and Massachusetts is one of the states. And when disaster strikes, uh, whether it is an earthquake in, in California or a tornado in Missouri or a terrible floods in Vermont or a tragedy in Massachusetts or a tragedy uh, in Texas, we should respond, you know, according to the law, uh, as a nation, coming together to help communities that have been ravaged by disaster. Uh, right-wing Republicans, and that, by the way, has been a fundamental concept of how we function as a government and as a people for many, many decades. 
And recently, right-wing Republicans like Rick Perry have moved away from that. We can't afford to do this. We shouldn't do this. Or if we do it, we have to cut education or Medicare and Medicaid before we can provide disaster relief. But when it strikes home, suddenly I guess it becomes a different issue and they want immediate help. So clearly this is an example of outrageous hypocrisy. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. Back with more of Brunch with Bernie right after this. The situation in Boston still the same as it was just a few minutes ago. Senator Sanders with us. Bernie, you're still here, right? I'm right here. Okay, great. So let's pick up some phone calls here on uh, things having to do with, well, here, this is a great one. Scott in Rockford, Illinois, listening on WCPT. Uh, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yes, uh, Senator Sanders, uh, I really appreciate everything you do. Um, my, my question, is there, you know, to, to try to, um, how should I say, uh, clarify all this spin that you hear from different, you know, Republicans and Democrats and everything else. Is there a website out there that shows the bill that is introduced into Congress and how everyone votes on it? Sure. You yep. know, whether it's the Senate or the House? Yeah. I mean, people need uh, to know. The answer is absolutely yes. There is a... Uh... There is a website uh, out there, I think it's under Thomas of the United States Congress, where you can track uh, every piece of legislation offered. And, and as you know, thousands and thousands of pieces of legislation are offered, and relatively few of them are actually voted on. Uh, and you can also find the votes that are cast on that on, on any bill that gets to the floor of the House of the Senate. And the website, just for reference, is named after Thomas Jefferson. It's thomas.loc, as in locate, dot gov. Uh, I beg your pardon? Lime, it's the li- oh, LOC, as in Library of Congress, yeah. So it's thomas.loc.gov.gop. Yeah, and that's a, it's a good website, and you can learn a lot about uh, about legislation. You can read the entire bill, the summaries of the bill, and so forth. Gene yeah. in Alachua. I know I'm mispronouncing that. Gene in Florida? Alachua. Alachua. Alachua, okay. There you go. You're on the air with uh, Bernie. Okay, my question for Senator uh, Sanders is that there's ever, if he had ever considered any possibility of a national ticket that involved himself and Senator Warren and to let him know if that was a possibility, myself and several of my friends would resign our jobs and work full-time for him. That's very kind of you. Um, you know, uh, running for national office is a huge responsibility on somebody with... Uh, my politics would run into incredible opposition from corporate America and all of the big money interests. And I mean, have problems with the media and have to raise a huge amount of money. So at the moment, at least, uh, let me just say this. I, I, it's a very generous compliment that you're offering me. And, uh, but right now I am very content being and very proud to be the uh, U.S. Senator from the state of Vermont. Stephen in Monterey, Tennessee. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Uh Tom and Bernie, it's it's a pleasure to speak to two people with integrity and concern for the American people. I have just one simple question. When are the Democrats and those philosophers like you going to use the word entitlements instead of, I, I mean, stop using entitlements uh, versus using uh, uh, earned benefits as a term? Uh, I don't use the word entitlements. I mean... I don't describe Social Security or Medicare as an entitlement. I think it is an earned benefit. But what is most important, and, um, you know, Stephen, you raise, you know, the really important issue, the philosophical issue now of where we are as a nation. What do we believe? Uh, our Republican, some of our right-wing Republicans, and sadly enough, the Republican Party has become essentially a right-wing party, uh, hold the view uh, that... Uh, People are not, should not be entitled as a right, as a right uh, to health care or to retirement uh, benefits in a significant way. Uh, and that is, my view, is, is very different. I believe that what the struggle of the last 70, 80 years has been all about is rights, is to guarantee that when people get old, 
they're at least going to have a solid and 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 strong uh, source of of revenue in order to live with dignity. Uh, and Social Security has never missed paying out one benefit in the last seventy plus years. It is a guaranteed uh, retirement uh, program. Uh, and in '65, in the mid '60s, we established Social Medicare and Medicaid programs, which have helped tens and tens of millions of people. I just was in a meeting uh, literally two hours ago where a fellow who was a veteran and a senior got up and he said, you know, I just came back from the hospital. I was diagnosed with leukemia. I had major surgery. Uh, I was in the hospital for a period of time. Uh, estimate the bill was a quarter of a million dollars in between my uh, veterans' benefits and TRICARE and, and, and Medicare. Uh, it didn't cost us anything. Uh, if we take seriously that all of us are equal, uh, that it is not only people who have a whole lot of money that can get good quality health care, but every person is entitled to health care. If we take seriously the fact that every kid who grows up in this country has the potential to be, you know, a scientist or uh, a, an engineer or a businessman or a teacher or, or can do great things with his or her life, then we've got to make sure that that kid gets that quality education regardless uh, of income. So uh, the debate uh, that we are facing right now is not only the immediate attacks on Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, and, and they were devastated, Medicare and Medicaid devastated in the Ryan budget, and the president has tragically come forward with this so-called chain CPI for Social Security and, 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 and benefits of disabled vets. Uh, we've got to fight that. But more importantly, we have got to create a nation which says that all of our people are entitled to certain rights, and the right is to live with dignity. You don't live with dignity, in my view, unless you have certain economic protections. You're not living in dignity if you're unemployed and you don't have enough food to eat. You're not living in dignity if you're sick and you can't get the health care that you need. And the truth of the matter is, you know, we can do all of those things. You can provide health care to people. You can provide nutrition to people. You can provide quality education to people. You can do these in cost-effective ways. But to do those things, we really need major, major political uh, changes in this country, and we have to take on, which is what the, this whole question was about, uh, an ideology, a Republican ideology, uh, which says that if you are sick, you know, you shouldn't be able to get government help in terms of health care and education. And Obviously, that's something that I strongly disagree with. Gerald in Belafonte, Pennsylvania. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Uh, hello. Um, thanks for taking my call. I really like you guys. Um, Senator Sanders, um, Ob President Obama's been giving the uh, Republicans a, like a carrot of lowering our inflation adjustment for uh, Social Security. Mm -hmm. And I think we should go back to to where it was before Reagan, he should have put that on the table instead of what he did. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, just to give you an example of just something that happened just a, a, a few days ago. This whole issue of how you determine what an appropriate cost of living adjustment for uh, a person is, it's not so easy, uh, if you think about it. Uh, and the reason it's, not, it's complicated and not so easy is if you are an 18-year-old right now, you spend a certain sum of money. The products that you buy, which may be an iPad or, or, or if you have the money, uh, or some other type of cell phone or you know some computer games, the prices for those products may, in fact, be lower than they were a year ago. For you, inflation is minimal or maybe has gone down for what you buy. On the other hand, if you are 80 years old and living in northern Vermont and you don't have a whole lot of money, how are you spending your money? Well, you're spending it on prescription drugs because when you get old, you get sick. You're spending it on health care. You're spending it on trying to keep your home warm in the wintertime. That's how you spend a lot of your money, spending it on food. In all of those areas, prescription drugs, health care, heating, food, costs have gone up. For an 18-year-old, they may have gone down. So to my view, and I speak, many economists will say, tell you the same thing. The way we determine COLAs for Social Security today probably underestimates 
what seniors are spending, that we should adjust the COLA upwards, not downwards. And what the so-called chain CPI does is it cuts it and makes it stingier. So that if you're 65 today, by the time you're 75, you would lose in your that 75th year about uh, $650 compared to what you otherwise would have gotten. So uh, that's my view on that. And, and we are looking hard at trying to create a separate index for seniors, which I think will end up being more generous uh, than the current. And certainly we're going to oppose to everything we can to defeat this change to CPI, which is absolutely unfair uh, to seniors and disabled vets. Yeah, Bernie, about 30 seconds of the break. Should we have a, a separate one also for disabled vets? Uh, well, I think we could take a look at how you know, disabled vets, if you're disabled, uh, in, in terms of many disabilities, you are going to be spending money by definition on health care as well. Mm-hmm. So if health care costs are going up, you're probably not getting as much as you should. If health care costs tomorrow go down, you may be getting too much. But what we want to do is find out exactly what what groups whether you're seniors or disabled, are actually spending. And I can tell you absolutely uh, that when seniors did not get any COLA two out of the last four years, uh, this COLA is not too generous, that's for sure. Senator Bernie Sanders with us, taking your calls here on our on our Brunch with Bernie Hour on the Tom Hartman Program, our national town hall meeting with Senator Bernie Sanders. Check out his website at sanders.senate.gov. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. When you're there, be sure to sign up for his newsletter, The Bernie Buzz. I get it. It's a great source of information. Well, I often share this stuff with you here on the air. Welcome back, Sandra, in Dallas, Texas, watching Free Speech TV on the DISH Satellite Network. You are on the air with Senator Sanders. Senator Sanders? Hi, Sandra. Hi. I wish we had more people in Congress that had your intelligence. Um, I was wondering, since we keep hearing cuts about um, benefits to seniors, why don't we ever hear anything about cuts to benefits of Congress? Fair enough. Uh, I think that what you will see, what you have seen is, if I'm not mistaken, I won't swear to it, but I think there has not been a raise in the last three years, and I think that as a result of the sequestration, I and uh, many other uh, members of the Congress will be making uh, contributions to local charities above and beyond what ordinarily would have been the case. I think uh, the public has got to know that it, that the Congress is aware of the pain that a whole lot of people uh, are hearing. But having said that, you can eliminate every congressional salary, and it will not you know, have any impact, any significant impact uh, on the overall budget. What we do need to do uh, is to address the issue of why we are making cuts when we should not be making cuts. So to my mind, whatever the salary may or may not be for members of Congress, you don't cut Social Security when it has nothing to do with the deficit, when it has a $2.6 trillion surplus and can pay out every benefit for the next 20 years. You don't cut benefits for disabled vets because you don't cut benefits for disabled vets. You don't balance the budget on people who lost arms and legs defending this country. You just don't do that. Uh, and I think if we raise revenue in a fair and proper way, understanding that, for example, uh, Sandra, in the last three years, between 2009 and 2011, those three-year period, every all of the new income created in this country went to the top 1%. Not 90%, not 95%, 100% of all new income. People on top are doing phenomenally well. The middle class is shrinking. People are really, really hurting. And you don't balance the budget on people who are in pain, who are struggling now to survive. You do ask people who are doing phenomenally well, and in many instances whose effective tax rates are quite low, to start paying their fair share. Okay. We have just a, just a minute until this next break, Bernie. Uh, you, uh, oh, there's one other thing I would mention, I, I, and I wanted to thank him publicly. Mm-hmm. Uh, last Friday, just a week ago today, we had Matt Taibbi, who I, I know you know, Tom. Yes. 
Uh, Matt was up in Burlington, Vermont. We did a wonderful town. We did two town meetings, one at the University of Vermont and one uh, in downtown Burlington on Wall Street. And uh, this issue of Wall Street, the power of Wall Street, uh, their control over the economy and the political life of this country, uh, Wall Street, uh, which in, in many people's view, including my own, really uh, has a business model which is largely fraudulent, uh, is an issue that we just need a whole lot of, uh, of discussion. And it, it pains me very much that there are very few people in the media, Matt Taibbi being one of the great exceptions, who have the courage and the intelligence to kind of delve into what goes on in, in Wall Street. Yeah. But I, I did want to, to mention that. He termed that vampire squid phrase. Yep. It's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour, our national town hall meeting with the guy I think of as America's senator, Senator Bernie Sanders. Although the good citizens of Vermont, by having been one for a decade, know him very well and are very proud of the fact that he's their senator. We'll be back with more of your calls for Bernie right after this. Welcome back. Ten minutes before the hour, the situation in Boston continues at a, uh, you know, they're still searching for this uh, young man, this 19-year-old uh, who is uh, on the lam. We will, at the top of the hour, have uh, journalist Charlie Pierce with Esquire and the Boston Globe. Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Well, we will, we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a more detailed news report at the top of the hour. In any case, Charlie Charlie's not, he was going to be with us Monday. Um, but back with brunch with Bernie, Senator Bernie Sanders here on the line with us. Joyce in Deer Lodge, Montana. You are on the air with Senator Sanders. Thank you, Tom, for taking my call. I have to laugh. You stumbled a little bit over my town. Yeah. Uh, anyway, first of all, thank you for this program. I've just recently started watching it. I didn't even know it existed. I'd never heard of it before. And I just, I love, I love free speech. Yeah. And I want to ask, oh, I'm sitting here looking at Bernie on the TV. Uh, I want to compliment you, uh, Senator Saunders. Sanders, uh, you're right up there with my favorite politician, and that was Mike Mansfield. Mm-hmm. Um, so your your, uh, your question, Joyce. I don't have admiration for many, very many of our congressmen or women. Um, but what I want, my main question for you, Senator, is I was very upset. Well, I'm going to explain a little bit. Very ex- upset when Tom announced, I believe it was last week, that the Senate had voted, or the Congress had voted, I guess Senate had voted, the entire body voted that it was all right for the congressman to have uh, insider trading information. Mm. And when I first learned about it, when I came out during one of the campaigns, I was just appalled. So do you believe that there are American citizens who are above the law? No, I don't. And to the best of my uh, knowledge, Joyce, uh, we dealt with that issue last year. Uh, and made it illegal uh, for any, not only member of Congress, but staffer uh, to utilize inside trading information. So I think that's an issue that came up, uh, my recollection is, last year, and I, and I think it was dealt with and passed. Glenn in Cary, Illinois. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Uh, is this Glenn? Did you ask for Glenn? Yep. <clears throat> okay, I lost it. Hey, uh, hi, Senator. I have a question for you. Can you kindly explain... Um, what happened to the filibuster? If I recall, after the fall election, Senator Reid was on cable news, network news, very irate, very verbalizing on how the Republicans have held legislation hostage. And I hear you repeating and Tom repeating the same thing. And my layman's understanding is, at the beginning of every uh, Senate, a uh, majority leader has an opportunity to change the rules, not the constitutional rules. I understand that, but change the rules. And I don't haven't heard a report what happened. And now here we are in April, and everybody's still complaining about the Republicans uh, not abiding by filibuster. Was it, was it, did Mr. Reid uh, drop the ball, or did the Senate drop well, the here's ball? Here's what happened, Glenn. I, I think your description uh, of the situation is accurate. Uh, you know, there are some rules, 
and laws that we abide by that are in the Constitution, how many United States senators there are and how many members of the House and all that. But the rules of each body are determined by the members themselves. They're not in the Constitution. Uh, some years back, uh, in fact, uh, it required 67 votes to override a filibuster. And during the whole civil rights debate, that went down to 60. So could it go down from 60 and, and end that completely to make it 51 votes carries? The answer is absolutely. You're also correct in stating that there was a lot of discussion uh, about this issue when the session began. Uh, and I can tell you, having been in many meetings, caucus meetings, this issue w was raised hot and heavy. I think what uh, Majority Leader Reid ended it up concluding is, number one, uh, he might not have the votes, as I recall, to go forward. Uh, not everybody in the Democratic caucus uh, supported that, and the Republicans certainly were not going to support it. So he had 55 votes, and I'm not sure that he thought that he would have over 50, 51 votes to make that happen. But having said that, I... There are debate, there's a debate about this, but there are at least some people who think that you can change the rules uh, midterm as well, that it doesn't have to be right at the beginning of the session. And I can tell you that there is growing frustration, not only of this, over this gun debate, but in many other areas where the Republicans are filibustering, delaying, uh, preventing uh, judges. We have a very serious problem in something as mundane and making sure that we have judges uh, staffing districts all over this country, and, and the Republicans have delayed that. Many vacancies out there. Uh, Obama's appointments to important uh, uh, departments being delayed. So there is concern, and I I voted against the agreement. The agreement that was reached had some improvements. It allows the Senate to move a little bit faster, but it did not deal with the with the real question, and that is whether you need 60 votes or 51 votes to carry. And I voted against that proposal because it just didn't go far enough. And I believe at the end of the day, you need 51 votes to carry. Bernie, we have about a minute and a half. Now, not quite enough time to bring another caller in. Thoughts on, on the week and as we go forward? Well, obviously, it has been, uh, you know, a difficult week uh, for, for this country in terms of uh, the Boston Marathon and, and, and the tragedy there. And... Um, and then what's happening literally right now on, on the streets of Boston, a uh, police officer killed uh, last night, um, and, and just makes uh, all of us shake our heads about what kind of world we live in when people can, can do these, these types of things. Um, and, uh, you know, but I think as, as American citizens, we've got to keep our eyes focused uh, on where we want to go, which is not only dealing with terrorism in this country and around the world, uh, but creating a nation in which all of our people can live with dignity. And one of the things that always concerns me, Tom, is how easy it is for folks inside the Beltway who are surrounded by a whole lot of moneyed folks who themselves are in good salaries to forget that there are millions and millions of people, some of whom are listening to this show right now, who don't have a job, who are really struggling uh, to put bread on the table uh, or to take care of their kids. And uh, we as a nation can do much better. Uh, so I think the message is that we've got to pay attention to what's going on. We've got to be involved. We've got to fight for what we believe in and create the kind of nation that you know, we all know that we, we can become. Thank you, Senator. Thanks so much for being with us. Okay. Bye-bye. Senator Bernie Sanders, sanders.senate.gov. We'll be back. Right